Welcome to our new series of videos on materials. The background information is found in Chapter 4, and we're starting off with 04 subsection 1, Materials Basic Properties. If we look at the atomic structure of various materials, for example, this might be an iron crystal. Um, the atoms are arrayed in something that we call a close pack configuration. And you'll notice that every atom here has as many atoms jammed around it as possible. And of course, <coughs> this is a three dimensional uh, issue and there are other variations that would have to be accounted for in the other direction. But this provides us a good diagram, diagrammatic basis for understanding the crystalline behaviors from a structural point of view. So this atom forms an atomic bond with that bond with that atom and with this atom and this one and so forth all the way around. These atomic bonds uh, help to stabilize all these atoms relative to each other. In this case, we've taken a small sample so that we can see all the individual atoms. This is the length of the sample. This is the width of the unstressed crystal. Now, if we put a, a stress on it, which might be achieved by uh, a number of different means, but let's just assume we have found a way to apply a tensile stress. So we have forces in this direction on every one of these atoms tending to stretch and deform this uh, crystal. Um, the length increases from the original length, which we designated as L, to the new length L plus delta L. Um, and while it's doing that, actually, the um, cloud of electrons that forms the bulk of the volume of the atom is deforming. So before the atoms were essentially spherical and now they've become elongated um, and they have a kind of an elliptical cross section. In the process of doing that, the sample has shrunk in width from its original dimension to some new dimension, which is the original dimension minus whatever the change is. So in every case, we're designating a change with the Greek symbol delta. If we put the sample under compression, uh, we squash the atoms into oblate spheroids. In the process, we shorten the sample from the original dimension of L to this new dimension, L minus delta L, <coughs> where delta L or minus delta L is the change in the dim dimension of the material in the direction of the stress. Uh, in this case, it turns out that the sample, which was originally a width W, increases to W plus delta W, where delta W is the change in width. Now, uh, if, if we had a perfect iron crystal like this, and we subjected it to stress, it would fail at a very high stress level, like roughly in the order of 2 million pounds per square inch. Which, by the way, is much stronger than any kind of structural material that we can build buildings out of. Um, the key to that is it has to be a perfect crystal. We can only grow perfect crystals of iron in little tiny crystals, which when you sort of put them on a piece of paper, they look like whiskers. And in fact, we sometimes refer to them as iron whiskers. And that's about the best we can do. When we go to make a bulk sample, a sample the process of cooling down is kind of chaotic and it's very difficult to maintain perfection for very long. So um, we end up with portions of the, of the bulk solid that look like this. And for the atoms, it's kind of like musical chairs. Um, they're all looking for a, the, the minimal energy uh, situation, which means they have 
the absolute maximum number of bonds to nearest neighbors, but some of them kind of get left out in the process. So for example, um, somewhere here we have an atom that is in fairly close proximity to six atoms around it, and that's a very stable state, but here we have a couple of atoms that uh, have only five uh, adjoining members or um, bonded or bonded to only five other atoms and what also makes that a particularly tricky situation is that the bond between these two is not further stabilized so for example if we put a shear force so like on this side we force it in that direction on this side in that direction we call that a shear force there's a tendency of atom A to move relative to atom B because it doesn't have any kind of triangulated forces that help to stabilize it. Uh, as a consequence, atom A starts to move to the right and it pulls atom C, so it's poised directly over atom D, and then atom C is happy to move further in that direction and then it pulls this atom. And so in the process, these voids, which we call dislocations, are in effect facilitating the failure of the crystal structure in that they are allowing movement of atoms by each other. Um, this process, by the way, can end up moving atoms a substantial distance away from atoms that they were originally connected to. We call this ductile or plastic flow. And in the process, the material changes shape and it never goes back to its original shape. So the really simple things you're familiar with are if you bend a coat hanger, it has dislocations of this sort and it ends up because of its ductility uh, that you can give it a new shape, which it will then hold. So we often use this ductile property as an important part of a manufacturing process relative to metals. If we uh, make a sample for testing, we often do it like this. We take a rod, we machine some threads in it, which we can then mount in whatever our testing device is. And then to make sure that the failure doesn't occur at the threads because that becomes the weakest part, not only because the cross section has been reduced, but because of the stress concentration associated with these tight corners in the material. We don't want it to fail there because it'll not only not give us valid data, but it'll tear up our testing machine. So we will take this and put it on a lathe and machine it down so that we know the failure will occur in this zone. Now, once we start to apply a stress, there's a whole series of planes, both this way and that way, that are in a state of shear. And those planes will start sliding by each other. And we end up with this kind of behavior where the material actually necks down if you've ever made toffee, you can, you've seen this uh, phenomenon in action. It's really hard to do it with steel. You need a pretty strong piece of equ equipment. But the material actually necks down. And ironically, the material gets stronger, so it doesn't just instantly fail. It actually, even though the cross-section is getting stronger, narrower or smaller, the material becomes what we call work-hardened. So let's talk about what that might be. And by the way, this is a sample similar to what we just talked about. This is the original sample for testing. This is one that has been failed and you'll notice the necking down process. And the other part of this sample has since disappeared. Okay, so one of the interesting things we can do is we can alloy iron with other atoms like carbon. Carbon atoms are smaller. And if we can selectively jam those carbon atoms into the dislocations, which were voids before, but in this diagram there's a carbon atom jammed in there, 
The carbon atoms become like grit in the gears or the ball bearings and they inhibit this ductile behavior and inhibit the tendency uh, for this uh, failure mode to occur. So, <clears throat> if we um, take a sample and we subject it to a stress in kips per square inch, we observe something called a strain, which I generally prefer to call a fractional deformation, which is change in length per length or inches per inches. Um, this is called a stress strain diagram. Uh, what I really dislike about the word strain is that it has the same number of letters as this word stress. It starts with uh, S and T and R. And uh, students have a remarkable ability to get those confused. So we're going to use the terminology stress for the influence that's causing something to happen and fractional deformation to describe the response to that influence. Now, if we take a sample and we start with zero stress, we have just zero deformation. And as we increase stress, we increase deformation. In the case of a sample of iron or steel, it will increase along this line in a linear way. And if we stop at any point here and we take the stress off, it will go back to its original shape. So why does that happen? Well, it happens because this process where we squash an atom, we're actually deforming the electron cloud. And the electron cloud is able to restore itself perfectly. It has basically no memory. And when you take the stress off, the electrons go back to whatever their natural configuration is. So as long as you are in the elastic range where all you're doing is squashing or, or stretching the atoms, like this or that or that, um, the deformation will be in proportion to the stress. And furthermore, the process is perfectly elastic. So when you take the load off, the load, the shape of the object comes back to its original shape and there is no residual deformation. Now, for certain materials, they exhibit this ductile behavior as we've talked about. And there's a grade of steel called 36 KSI steel. And when you get to 36 kips per square inch, you begin to see ductile flow and deformation. So if you apply a load till you get over here and then you take the load off, it will track back down a path like this that's absolutely parallel to that because the, the slope of this line is dependent upon the electronic nature of the electron clouds around the atom. And um, so this is the same slope and the same behavior as we observed back here except that when you stop the stress, you now see that there's a residual deformation because plastic flow has happened and atoms have flowed by each other and they never go back. <coughs> <coughs> they never go back to find their original nearest neighbors. They just settle in with whatever new neighbors they've got. So this straight line portion is called the elastic portion of the uh, material. This is called the plastic flow region. Uh, this slope right here is really crucial. Um, the slope is steeper if it takes more force in this direction or more stress to produce a given deformation. So the steeper the slope of this line, the stiffer the material. So we would actually write here F is equal to E, where E is the stiffness, so that's right here. F is equal to E times the fractional deformation. And I apologize, because here I've got the lowercase Greek letter, and here I've got the lowercase English letter, 
and those two things are interchangeable depending on what text you're reading out of but I should have at least been consistent for the purposes of this presentation. So F is equal to E times lowercase e or epsilon and E is then the slope of this line and that slope is 29,000 kips per square inch. And then if we want to know well what's what's the stress at this point where we have 0.001 uh, fractional deformation, we multiply that slope times 0 0.001 and we see that when we get to this point we have 29 kips. All common grades of steel that we use have exactly the same slope or in other words exactly the same stiffness uppercase E equals to 29,000 KSI and the only difference between different grades of steel is the point at which this yield occurs. So if we have a 50 KSI steel it tracks along the same line but it yields at 50 KSI. Now the reason that happens is we've somehow in that steel managed to block a lot of dislocations by jamming carbon atoms into them and so we can observe the linear plastic behavior excuse me the linear elastic behavior over a longer range because the material doesn't yield as early all right so let's look at several different grades of steel here here's 36 ksi here we go up further and we get to a 50 KSI yield stress. Up even further we get to 65. These are all common grades for rolled steel sections like wide flanges and angles. Certain kinds of plate and rod are cold rolled steel. So they're, they're rolled under incredible stress. They come out very work hardened and you can get up around uh, 100 KSI for the yield stress. And for drawn wire, it, discovered, it, it uh, turns out you can get up to around 250 KSI as the yield stress. Drawn steel wire, by the way, is fairly brittle so you don't observe any nice ductile or yielding behavior. It just snaps. And by the way, this line right here represents the amount of strain that would occur for high strength steel wire. What that means is that in order to get the full capacity of high strength steel wire active, you have to allow it to deform quite a bit. And so we often don't use steel wire on buildings because it basically moves too much or elongates too much and as a consequence people find it uncomfortable to occupy buildings that have that much movement. We also uh, would love to use high strength steel with something like concrete. The problem is the steel moves too much that there ends up with huge stress con concentration and and deformation in the concrete. So generally we can't use high strength steel cable with concrete unless we pre-stress or post-tension the steel. So these curves all represent steel. This curve represents aluminum. It turns out that the slope of the steel line is 29,000 KSI for E. The slope of the aluminum line is about 10,100 KSI for the stiffness E. So in other words, steel on a per square inch basis is about three times as stiff as aluminum. Um, aluminum turns out has a much lower density than steel though. So if you do it on a per pound basis, the two have about the same stiffness. You can't compare uh, a square <coughs> inch of 
a material that has a density like aluminum to a square inch of the steel material because the steel material weighs about three times as much. <clears throat> so we've also shown several grades of concrete here and then some wood. According to this, of course, wood is by far the weakest material and then concrete is next. And way up above that is aluminum and then way up above that is steel. Keep in mind though, this is all in kips per square inch. And these materials are radically different in density. For example, this one says specific gravity equals 7.85, which is its density compared to water. Aluminum is 2.65 and concrete is 2.32. And then wood is way down around 0 0.4 to 0.7. And most of the structural grades that we use are actually right around 0.5. So one other comment. Um, in a building, we try to operate under all the normal design loads that we will have. Uh, at a fraction of the yield stress. We feel like if we've reached the yield stress, we've usually made a mistake, although I can show you some exceptions to that. So for example, 50 KSI steel, we would try to never exceed 30 KSI under the full design load. Now that's not the factored load, that's the full load. Um, but nonetheless, in the working life of that building, the stress should never exceed about 60% of the yield stress. So in really bold lines here, I've put the sort of working range for steel, uh, in this case 50 KSI steel, 35 KSI aluminum, uh, and each of these grades of concrete, F sub C equals 5 KSI, 4 KSI, and then wood. Now, um, we'd like to somehow make a, fair, a more fair comparison between these materials, because as we've said, that the steel is almost three times as dense as, con as aluminum, it's more than three times as dense as concrete, and it's about 50 time, 15 times as dense as wood. So clearly comparing a square inch is not um, a particularly meaningful way to do this. So let's look at a, a block, for example, a, a block of some material that we want to uh, understand. It has a cross-sectional area A and a height H. And on the bottom, under its own self-weight, there's a stress on the bottom of the block of material as it just sits on whatever surface that supports it. So we say the weight is equal to W, which is the density times the volume, which is the density times the volume uh, symbolically. And then the volume is the cross-sectional area times the height. So we have D times A times H. So the stress at the bottom is going to equal W over A, which is D times A times H. So we put that in the numerator and we divide by A and we're left with DH. <clears throat> to get the maximum height uh, that the material can reach under its own self weight, we stack it tall enough so that this stress at the bottom is equal to the yield stress. In other words, we say D times whatever that H max is, is going to equal Fy. So H max is equal to Fy over D. Clearly, the larger Fy is, the taller we can stack it. The more dense it is, the less tall we can stack it because density occurs in the denominator here. When we go through and we make some adjustments, instead of F now, which was stress, we're going to, for every material, take F over D, where D is the d density for that particular material. When we do things like that, the, the whole situation kind of turns upside down. 
Before we had the, all the grades of steel stronger than aluminum, but now we see here's a 65 KSI steel, 50 KSI, 36, and up here is our 35 KSI aluminum. In other words, if we don't compare on a per square inch basis, but we compare on an equal weight basis, the aluminum strength is much higher than steel. This is why you often hear advertisements for automobiles where they say we've got all these aluminum parts which are pound for pound stronger than steel. And that's absolutely true. It's also, of course, the reason why we make airplanes out of aluminum instead of out of steel. Uh, but here's an interesting comparison. You'll notice the slope of the aluminum and the slope of the steel are almost exactly on top of each other. And so if stiffness is your design criterion, steel and aluminum are about equal. Now, I think I said before, and I'll probably say it many more times, uh, more often than not, stiffness governs the design of a structure, especially a structure for a building, uh, more often than does strength. In other words, people's desire or the situational needs for stiffness produce a stronger building or a heavier building than would be produced if our only concern was for strength. And so where buildings are concerned, this claim that aluminum is pound per pound stronger than steel is not particularly pertinent because often stiffness is the most important thing. Stiffness governs the deflection of beams. It also governs the strength of columns that are uh, likely going to fail by buckling. So <clears throat> steel is still the preferred material. The other thing that makes steel really attractive is that its price is less than a fifth of the price of aluminum on a per pound basis. So even if strength was the issue, this little advantage here is nothing like the five times advantage uh, of steel on the cost side. So as a consequence, we don't see very many building structures made out of aluminum. One of the things you want to notice here is that wood, even just high grade pine or fir, is now a very strong material which is very competitive to steel. And uh, just out of uh, sort of historical interest the largest airplane that was ever produced was called the Spruce Goose. It wasn't actually made out of spruce. That's a word, uh, a phrase that some journalist coined. Um, it was made out of birch, and but it had an extremely high strength to weight ratio. Actually better than aluminum. Ironically, uh, it's also not the fire issue that made us abandoned wood. It's that wood, when you really carefully select it, you need experts to do that. And often um, the cost of those experts and the cost of the material is way too high. Uh, whereas aluminum, we have developed ways of manufacturing really high strength aluminum with extreme reliability and consistency. Okay, so, so far we've been plotting the compression quadrant. And now we're going to plot the compression quadrant and the tensile quadrant. And, and there, we want to do that for two reasons. One is concrete is really terrible in tension. It's really pretty decent in compression. Although you'll notice concrete is by far on a per pound basis the weakest material that we commonly use. So if being super lightweight is important, we wouldn't use concrete. For example, we wouldn't make concrete planes. On the other hand, concrete is very uh, inexpensive compared to these other materials. Um, it's a good damping material. It is a good uh, material for creating acoustic barriers. And it doesn't rot and corrode. 
So there are a lot of things to recommend concrete, even though as one of our structural materials, it's, it is on a per pound basis about as weak as we get, except for masonry. And uh, masonry is just, um, from a structural point of view, not one of our better materials. The story of the three little pigs notwithstanding. Okay, so we show the compression quadrant here which is the one we were just looking at, but we've reduced it down so we can do this tensile quadrant. And you'll notice here's the concrete on the compression side. And on the tension side, the stress capacity is about one tenth of what it is on the compression side, which accounts for the fact that you really can't do uh, concrete without some kind of tensile additive, such as steel. We've already talked about the fact that you can't use aluminum as a reinforcement because of the thermal expansion differential. Uh, you can use carbon fiber uh, or carbon fiber rebar um, in addition to steel. And there are other types of plastic and glass that have been used. The other thing to note is the stress capacity of wood in tension is not quite as good as it is in compression. And that's because primarily because of knots Knots work well in compression, but they're very poor in tension. Okay, so let's talk about common materials. And I hate to start a list of common materials for buildings with titanium, but um, <clears throat> titanium has been used on some of Frank Gehry's buildings, so we mention it here. Uh, here we have the yield stress, the material stiffness, sometimes called the elastic modulus, although I'm not fond of that term because the word elastic seems to imply to a lot of people that it's like rubber and very stretchy. And actually E is more like the, the inverse of that. It's the material stiffness. So let's go down uh, the column of yield stresses, titanium, the highest grade titanium, is 200 kips per square inch. Certain alloys of uh, titanium, which by the way we might want because of superior weatherability or something, they're much, much weaker. High strength steel cable is pretty good, 250 kips per square inch. Steel plate can go from 100 down to 32. Rolled steel sections are typically in the range of 65 to 36. Uh, aluminum, our common structural grade is 35. We can do a lot better than that in something like bicycle frames, but we have to go to a lot of trouble to achieve that better performance. And then in the uh, case of uh, structural materials like pine, fir, and hemlock and so forth, uh, they go everywhere from a failure stress of 6 kips per square inch down to 1.6. And then concrete, we've got if going from eight down to two. In this part of the country, what you almost always get is either five or four, or in some footings, you might settle for three. In certain places, though, they have an infrastructure for delivering much higher strength concrete. And so this number could go much higher than that in, say, Chicago. Okay, the material stiffness. We see that steel, of all the things listed here, is the highest, 29,000 kips per square inch. And by the way, one of the things that makes designing to steel really wonderful is that all these things, steel plate and roll steel sections, they all have the same stiffness. Aluminum is 10,100, and we just go down the list here. So here we've listed the density of these materials. You'll notice steel is very high. Um, titanium is higher than aluminum, um, but not tremendously heavy. And titanium is, especially if you use one of these tempered beta alloys, is incredibly strong, which is why some of our really expensive high-speed fighter planes are made out of titanium rather than aluminum. FY over D, we're just basically dividing out the density to get some sort of comparison. When we do that, <laughs> this is a weird terminology, but 
we talked about FY over D being the height that you could stack the material or that you could hang it, for example. So uh, just a simple rod of titanium, if you could brace it against buckling, could go 19 miles high. And just for reference, our tallest building, and I guess maybe our tallest structure in the world, is about a half a mile. That would be the Burj Khalifa. Uh, steel cable. You could hang a piece of steel cable almost 14 miles, which turns out to be pretty significant because the deepest part of the ocean is 7 miles, which means with high-strength steel cable we can still salvage things off the bottom of the ocean. Although it turns out to be really problematical to dangle a cable seven miles down into the ocean from a ship that's bobbing up and down in the waves. There's all kinds of uh, stress issues associated with wave action and clearly we've lost a large capacity of the cable just holding up its own weight. All right, so we go down the list. Let's look at a few others like rolled steel sections. According to this, we could build a building that's uh, 3.6 miles high uh, or in that neighborhood out of steel. The problem, of course, becomes um, cost and complexity. So, E over D, by the way. Our, our uh, stiffness for steel is 1,614 compared to 1,669 for aluminum. So the aluminum is a tiny bit stiffer, but not really an appreciable amount. And it's a lot more expensive. Okay, so here's the uh, structural properties of earth or soil. Um, Igneous or metamorphic rock can handle about 300 kips per square foot. Uh, we got weathered rock, dense sand, stiff clay. And then we get down to soft clay, which is pretty much what we have all around the triangle area. And typically the number is about three kips per square foot. And I want you to notice this number. This is kips per square foot. For our other materials, we're typically talking about kips per square inch because they're very strong materials. Soil is so weak, though, that we have to jump to a per square foot basis before this number becomes large enough to be reasonable to use. So um, anytime you take this number, you need to really keep in mind that you're making some kind of transition when you go to soil to such a poor material that we're basically using different units. And you need to be really careful not to get that mixed up. Okay, now there's a, a section in the book that deals with uh, what I call exotic materials like boron fibers, graphite fibers, glass fibers, and so forth. And by the way, I will often use these terms interchangeably. Graphite fibers and carbon fibers are the same thing. There's no difference. Those are just two different terms that get applied to it. These fibers can only be made in fibers so far. And so we typically have to embed them uh, in something, <clears throat> something like epoxy. <clears throat> and the epoxy is relatively very weak. So um, when you go to graphite fibers and epoxy, you get much more uh, mediocre performance than you do when you have the full strength of the materials. But the purpose of this is to put in perspective how all these more common materials look relative to graphite fibers. That ends our discussion from subsection one of chapter four, or excuse me, section one of chapter four on materials basic properties. <laughs>